Um, hi, everybody. I'm going to give you a demo on um, how I want you to do this uh, activity, this, uh, this activity number three. Um, <clears throat> I, I feel like I have put a lot of instructions in here, and um, I, I'm not 100% sure how clear they are. And I think maybe if I, you know, kind of show you what I, what I want you to do, um, <clears throat> in addition to the written um, instructions, I would, I, I think that that might be uh, beneficial. So um, anyhow, uh, th this week's activity is broken up into two parts. You've got um, the, the first part, part one is what I'm going to demonstrate right now. Um, and, and that is, of course, um, where you're going to be taking six different compositions each of the same object, you need to have something white. Uh, and you'll see in my example, I used a roll of paper towel. I'm hoping you can get a little bit more creative than that, but I didn't have time to be creative when I'm trying to build this course. So. Um, <clears throat> but, but you're going to be taking six different exposures in six different lighting environments but it's going to be the same exact composition each time because you're going to use bracketing. Um, there's a couple of things I want to make sure that you understand when, when, when you're getting started. You should be able to set your camera to shoot on RAW plus JPEG. Um, if your camera doesn't do that, let me know and I'll um, I'll talk you through some steps in, in, in Lightroom, how you can take those, uh, those raw files and, and export them as JPEGs. Uh, we're going to have to be able to do that eventually anyway, but um, I'm thinking that most of your cameras should have that uh, capability. Um, and it's, it's for at least for this activity, I think it's a real good idea to, to do it. I don't always leave mine on RAW plus JPEG. Sometimes I just use it on, on, on RAW, but um, there's a lot of reasons why having a RAW and a JPEG of each exposure can can make your life a lot a lot easier. Okay, so before you get started, look in your user's manual and make sure that you uh, you know how to do that. If you do not have RAW plus JPEG capability, then just shoot in RAW. And, uh, and, and let me know, okay? Um, so we've got the six different lighting situations. I've got an indoor, um, I've got three indoor and three outdoor, okay? So the, the three indoor, you've got your, um, you know, your light bulb, whether that's incandescent or, or tungsten, um, and you should have a setting on your, on your white balance that probably looks like a little picture of a light bulb, okay? Um, you should also have a setting specifically for, for fluorescent. Um, and then I'd like you to go ahead and do the setting where you use your flash plus another light source, okay? Um, and, and I'm personally, I'm not crazy about the flashes that, that come on our cameras. I, I don't really advocate relying on them most of the time, but there, there are situations where they'll come in handy. And I think one way that they could kind of come in handy is if um, maybe your subject is backlit, you know, like say maybe you've got your subject, your, your white object, whatever it is, um, in front of a window or something. And, you know, the, the light is coming in from behind it. And if you just look at it, it's going to be kind of silhouetted out. If you um, tell it to use the flash, it'll fill in all those shadows and you'll get a, a you know, like a more even uh, a type of lighting. But of course, that's also going to change the, um, the, the temperature of, of your, of your light as, as well. Okay. Um, so, uh, after you've done your indoor shots, um, or maybe just kind of plan around the weather, if you can, if you can take advantage of a nice cloudy day, um, cloudy days are actually the best time to take pictures outside. Uh, the, the best type of uh, daytime light, um, the reason being that there are no shadows, because if there's a, a, a lot of clouds between you and the sun, they're diffusing that light. And, um, you know, one of the things that is, is really um, hard about shooting in sunlight is the shadows can be very, very harsh, uh, especially if they're directly overhead. Um, so if, if you're shooting 
you know, like say outside on a sunny, sunny day, you want to avoid midday. There's, I, I can think of very few instances when shooting with the sun just directly overhead is uh, on a sunny day is your best is your best option. That's going to create um, shadows underneath your subject. Um, it's it's for you know taking pictures of people or whatever. It's very very harsh. It's very unflattering. Um, so you know whenever there's a cloudy day. Um, as a photographer, you really ought to take advantage of that because that's that's prime prime photography <laughs> uh, con conditions. Um, if the day is sunny, um, go either in the morning or in the late afternoon. You know, anytime between dawn and you know mid morning is great because you know the sun is still low on in, in the horizon it hasn't gotten completely overhead yet uh, and of course with the days getting shorter like they are now that we're in the the fall semester um, especially after they set the clocks back you know it might be that you could even uh, start going around maybe four o'clock or so um, usually in the afternoons or the evenings uh, de depending on what time of year it is you'll you'll have like a good hour or so that it's that the light is really really nice and within that you'll have like right before the sun goes down maybe about a 20 minute window of time that you know sometimes we call it the golden hour you know because the, the light just right before the sun comes down or right after it comes up when it's really really low on the horizon really really um close to the horizon and low in the sky it's it just creates the most beautiful glowing light it's very very flattering for um for, for portraits um landscapes everything it just it just you can hardly go wrong with that so when you do your sunny day please avoid uh going midday okay um then also i want you to shoot outdoors on a sunny day in the shade and if you're in the shade it doesn't matter what time of day it, it is and in fact if you're going to be taking pictures outside on a sunny day and it is midday like that you really need to get your subject in into the shade i think that's the only way that it's um that, that it's going to work out well for you um and and so you, you know the point of this whole uh, lesson being that um each of these different light circumstances the light has a different what we call temperature um and and by temperature we we really just mean color you know that the that the light has a different tendencies to um, lean towards what we would call the warm colors, which would be like our reds, our oranges, our yellows. Those would be considered warm. Um, and then in other lighting situations, um, you know, they might lean more towards the greens and the, and the blues, which we would consider our cool colors. And, you know, what, what we're kind of ideally always looking for is a nice balance where you've got um, somewhat neutral, and that's why I'm having you work with a white object because that way you can look at the object and you can tell um, if that white is leaning a little bit towards the purple or leaning a little bit towards the orange. You, you know, at, at what setting does that white look like a neutral uh, white? Um, so, so a couple of things that um, I'll try to point out as I'm um, showing you my examples. Um, Make sure you understand the, the rule of thirds, okay? Um, th this is probably one of the best principles that, that you can follow as, as far as just being able to set up a good composition. You know, I don't care how beautiful your light is or, you know, how pretty your detail is or, you know, how great your exposure or your focus or whatever is. If you don't have a co good composition, it doesn't matter, okay? The composition is, is absolutely absolutely critical and um, I think a lot of people who don't have much experience try to just um, take their subject and place it right in the middle of the frame. Now that's not always a bad thing to do and the rule of thirds is definitely not something that we have to um, comply with all the time. Um, it's, it's a general overall most of the time good idea but of course there are always reasons why you might intentionally go against that principle or rule as as well but for the most part resist the urge to put your subject right in the center 
Place your subject a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right of the center. Uh, make sure you pay attention to the, um, the, the, the reading material, and I believe I've got a video in there as well about the, the rule of thirds. It's a very, very simple concept, and it's going to make all the difference in the, in the world. Okay. Um, now, whatever it is that you choose for your white object, I want you to use the same object in each lighting situation. Okay. I'm, in my, mine, I'm just using a roll of paper towel. I'm, I'm sure I could have gotten um, a little bit more inventive than that, but um, it was really, really taking a lot of time to put these assignments together, you guys. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to expect your work to look better than, than than my example does. Okay, just let's just put it put it right out there like that. Okay, pay attention to everything you see in your frame. Okay. Um, of course, there's going to be something in the in the background, but everything you see is there. Okay, so if, if there's something distracting, move it. Or if, if you can't move the distracting object, reposition your subject, reposition yourself so that that distracting object is not, is not in there. Okay, um, I, I think a lot of times when we're just getting started with photography, we tend to look through the viewfinder and um, you know, we get so focused on our subject that we lose sight of everything that's going on around the subject. Um, everything is in there, you know, so if there's a, a laundry basket or, you know, a McDonald's cup or, or, or whatever, um, unless you want that to be a part of your composition, you need to get it out of there. Um, because everything that I see or that your, that your audience sees in, in your photograph is going to be regarded as intentional, you know, so everything that's in there, there needs to be intent and, and you have a lot of control. All you have to do a lot of times is just move yourself one step to the left or one step to the right and the whole composition changes, you know, so don't get in a big hurry. Um, you know, t t take, take time, uh, you know, use care when, when you do this, try a few different things. Um, you know, even for just these quick little demos that I did, I tried, you know, two or three different variations on, on, on the ones that I did um, because, you know, a lot of times the first, the first thing you do isn't, isn't always, always the best you can do. You know, sometimes we have to get warmed up, and I, that's certainly the case for me when I'm, when I'm taking pictures, okay? Um, when, when you're working with your, with your light, it's generally best if the light is coming from one side or the other, okay? You very rarely want to have your light source just directed straight on at your subject. What that's going to do is, you know, like say you put a, a light and you shine it directly on your white object, it's just going to flatten everything out and it's going to make it so that you can't really see the depth or the, or the detail of that object very well. Um, also, in, in, unless you have a good reason otherwise, you should, as a general rule of thumb, always when you're outside have the sun coming over your shoulder, not over their subject's shoulder. Okay, you, you very rarely want your subject with the light source directly behind it. Now, there are, you know, always reasons why you might exactly want to do that. You know, if you're looking for that silhouette effect, then, then by all means do it. Um, and, and this is also where the flash comes in handy is if you have a backlit subject, you know, say, say you're taking a picture of somebody at the beach at sunset and the, and the sun is, you know, right, right behind your subject's shoulder, you're shooting directly into the sun. Um, you're, you're not going to be able to see your subject's features, but if you go ahead and use your flash, what it does is it fills in those shadows. Um, so feel free to, tr to try a backlit subject um, for, your, for your flash um, picture that you, that you do for this activity. See, see what happens, okay? Um, make sure that um, <laughs> make sure that you, your shutter speed is no slower than 1 60th of a second. Um, so, sometimes what I do, um, especially if I'm in kind of a low light situation as I go ahead and put my camera on shutter priority and I set it to a 60th or an 80th of a second um, and then I let it figure out, you know, what the appropriate f-stop is for that. 
Now we haven't talked about depth of field yet, so um, and I don't really want to get into that till next week. So this isn't always the right choice, but um, you know this is still just kind of a, a warm up exercise more than anything else. But uh, you, you know these do need to be in focus. Um, I will leave it up to you if you want to use your tripod or not. You're you're always going to have a better quality picture if you use your if you use your tripod, especially for something like this where you want the same. Um, it, the same composition, you know, six different uh, with six different exposures. Um, I, I did not use my tripod on mine because I was in kind of a hurry. Um, and but uh, you know, it's 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 up it's up to you. But you'll find that uh, you, you know you're going to get a nicer, more clearly, more more well thought out image if you do go ahead and use a tripod. Um, but that said, if that's not possible or it's not desirable for you to use a, a, a tripod, um, you know, pay attention to how you're holding your camera. Um, anything with a shutter speed slower than a 60th of a second and, and you're probably going to get what's called camera shake um, where, y you know, you're going to move a little bit and it does, you know, it seems like a 60th of a second is really, really fast, but, you know, not when you're comparing it to like a thousandth of a second or a two thousandth of a second, right? Um, a 60th of a sec second in, in photography terms is, is really kind of on the slow side. And you can get, you know, either your subject or you or both can move uh, uh, just enough to be out of focus in that, in that time. So, um, you know, hold your camera in such a way, keep your, keep your elbows in close. Um, if you, if possible, rest on something, you know, re re rest your elbow on a wall or, uh, you know, a table or something like that, what, whatever you can do to give yourself a little bit more stability um, with, with the slower shutter speeds, um, you, you know, do that. And, and, if, and if you're shooting outside, you know, this is probably not going to be an issue. I'm thinking really more uh, for, for inside. Um, you know, have your ISO as low as possible. Um, you know, ha have it to the lowest possible setting. Um, but um, because why do we want to do that? Because the higher your ISO, the grainier it is. So, you know, don't just go out there and, and use a super, super high ISO. Don't use a thousand ISO if you can get away with a 400. Okay. And, you know, what I think you'll find is that when you go outside during the sunny day, you'll probably have no reason why you can't use a 100 or a 200 ISO. E even on the cloudy day, you should be able to use a lower ISO. Um, indoors, you're probably going to have to go up some because there's just not as much light in, in, inside. But, uh, um, y you know, th this is, th these are the decisions you have to start learning, you know, how you want, these are the decisions you have to start learning to make since we're not going to be using um, fully automatic anymore. You know, how fast do I want my shutter speed to go? Is, is, is movement important? Um, you know, how big do I want my aperture? Is depth of field important? We'll talk about that next week. Um, you know, and, and how much, um, how much do I need to compensate for the available light with the sensitivity on my, uh, on my sensor? And, and that's the ISO and the lower, the better, always. Okay. So this is just, you know, three most important things you can have in mind always when you're, when you're making an exposure. Um, if your camera has auto bracket and, and I'm going to assume that they do. Um, if not, you're going to have to, you're going to have to just use your, um, exposure compensation, um, and, and, and set your white balance manually. But um, you should, I, I think you should have an auto bracket and there's all sorts of different settings you can choose. You can tell it how many exposures you want to bracket. Um, three is fine for this exercise. Some people like to do five. Uh, you can tell it how big of an increment you want. You can, you can do a whole f-stop. You can do a third of an f-stop. You can do... Um, you know, a half stop. It's there. There's all sorts of different of, of different options on there, um, and you can do the same thing for white balance. You can, uh, you if if you can do your settings on auto on your white balance on on your camera. Uh, I, I believe you can tell it by plus or minus how many degrees Kelvin 
um, you're, you're wanting. Um, and so I've got, uh, here, I've got 250 degrees. I, I'm actually, you guys, um, I can see where I've just made a mistake because I've got 250 degrees Kelvin here. Uh, but then on the, on the sample post, um, I'm, I'm, I'm asking for it to be, uh, um, yeah, I think I've got it. I've got it where I wanted you to do it at, you know, plus or minus 500 degrees Kelvin. And in, in my experiments, I didn't really see a big enough difference at 250. So by the time you go back and do this, this will have changed. Let's just go ahead and assume that I, instead of 250 here, I'm going to put 500. Okay, so you'll have one as metered. Um, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll set it on you know, your shade or your cloud or, or, or whatever, one is metered, then one that's plus 250 degrees Kelvin, which is, I'm sorry, plus 500 degrees Kelvin, which is going to make it a, a bluer, cooler image, and then one that is minus 500 degrees Kelvin, and that one's going to be warmer. So you should have like kind of a warm, a neutral, and a, and a cool, okay? Um, so let's see, we've done this part before where I've given you like just really, really precise instructions here. Yeah, see here I've got, it says 500 Kelvin. So I'm going to change that to match that. Okay. Um, just as I'd had you do before, just go ahead and take my little table that I've created for you and copy it. And let's see, let's just do part one for now. I'll come back and do part two in a separate, in a separate lecture. How about that? Uh, copy. Okay. And then let's go to um, create blog entry. And I'm going to go ahead and create a sample blog. And I always like to make my window bigger. Command V. There we go. Okay, so just like I had done before, um, I've, I've placed just a little holder picture in, in each of these blocks for you so that all you have to do is delete that and replace it um, with your own picture. And then I want to make sure that you're, um, you know, recording all that metadata. You, you know, what, what is your ISO? What's your f-stop? What's your shutter speed? And how many degrees Kelvin? was it okay um and and then the the, the first three are going to be for exposure okay so you're going to have one that's a little bit darker right the, the one in the middle will be as metered okay then you're gonna have one that's a stop darker a stop lower okay and then you're gonna have another that's a stop lighter you can either do that with your auto bracketing or with your exposure compensation. That's, that's you know, depends on you and, and, and your camera. Um, then of these three, you know, whichever of these look to you like the best composite um, um, exposure, um, which might be the middle one, but it might not be, you know, it might be the lighter one. It might be the darker one, whichever one of these seem to be the best. Use it as a starting point for your white balance bracketing. Okay, so you're going to have the one in the middle will be as metered. If you put the if you're shooting in the shade and you put the little um, white balance meter to say shade, which probably has like a little picture of a house with a with a shadow coming off of it, um, do that one in the middle. Do one that's minus 500 degrees Kelvin. It's going to be redder, and then do another one that is plus 500 degrees Kelvin, cooler then you're metered, okay? And so for each of these, we've got the incandescent, the fluorescent, the uh, indoor with the flash, outdoor full sun. I'm just gonna go ahead for you guys, um, the, the best example I had yesterday when I was shooting was my outdoor on a cloudy day. So I'm just gonna go ahead and you know put, put my cloudy pictures in here for you. Um, and you know just as a reminder, you guys should already know how to do this, but um, you know, you just delete the picture that I put, click on the little picture icon here, and look for your, look for your file on the computer. Now remember I had told you guys that we're going to be shooting in JPEG plus RAW, or RAW plus JPEG. You're going to be loading your JPEG for this, this part of the, um, of the activity. I don't even think Blackboard can read 
raw. In fact, I know it can't. Okay. Um, so if, if you look at what I've got here, every one of my um, files, you know, I've got two versions of it. I've got the raw file on the JPEG for 8266. I've got the raw file on the JPEG for 8265. And I wanted to come over here and look at the size for a moment, you know, just, just to point out um, these files are huge. These files are really, really big. Um, you know, first of all, the JPEG that it gives me is the biggest uh, quality, you know, it's the largest file and the highest quality JPEG options that, um, th that are in my camera. So already my JPEGs are four megabytes, which is, you know, not anything to sneeze at. That's actually a pretty good sized file right there. But look at the, look at the raw file. Same exact composition, same everything. But with all that additional pixel depth, it's 31 megabytes, many, many times bigger than, than this raw file, I mean, than the JPEG, okay? There's that much more pixel information in there for you to work with, for you to get, um, you know, variation for editing, for getting detail, for getting subtle, um, you know, changes in light all sorts of things, okay? Um, this is you probably, I, I think one of the most important things you can take away from this class is always shoot in RAW. Um, another thing that's very important is looking at the size of these files. You need to become um, good at culling, okay? You're not gonna wanna just keep every single picture that you take. Um, you know, I, I usually kind of cull somewhat on the fly, like when I'm out shooting, like if I know I've got an out of focus picture or a bad shot or whatever, I just go ahead and delete it off my camera right away. When in doubt, hang on to it. You know, don't, don't delete anything until you're sure you want to delete it. But, um, you know, say when you get back home and you load these into, um, Lightroom, um, you, you know, go ahead and only import the ones that you know you want to work with or you think you might want to work with if it, you, know, you know all the ones that you know for sure are no good I would go ahead and delete them and if there's any doubt wait you can always delete them later but you can't get them back um, but you you don't want to be storing a bunch of raw files that you don't need to be storing because these guys are going to fill up your you know your hard drive or your Dropbox account or whatever it is that you have for storage um, real fast. Okay. Uh, so I just, I just wanted to, to, to point that out. And then coming back to um, our activity here, um, I'm going to have you uploading the JPEG. This is the whole reason why I asked you guys to, um, this whole reason why I asked you guys to shoot in JPEG plus raw. Okay. So I'm going to I've written down the numbers of the ones that I wanted to load for this. So I already know what they what they are, um, you know, I guess we could look at it this way, but I like to, if, if I already know the numbers, I'm just, I like to look at them in a list. Makes it, let's see, 8228, where's that? Okay, so here's 8228 as a JPEG. I'm gonna click on that and I'm gonna tell it choose. And this is already a really good sized file. Um, it, it probably varies from, from camera to camera, but notice that it took a moment before it, it even loaded up anything. So, um, you know, be kind of patient with it because I don't think it's going to let you change the size until there's something here. Okay, so then click on the appearance tab and uh, the, the look at how big this is. This is just my JPEG and it's 6,000 pixels wide by 4,000 pixels tall. That's already a pretty big file. And I'm asking you to tell it, you're bringing it way down because I want it to be no longer than 200 pixels on its longest side. So you can do either a horizontal or a vertical format for this one. But if it's horizontal, I want it 200 pixels wide. If it's vertical, I want it 200 pixels tall. And then you only have to change that one dimension because as long as this is checked, the other one will, will change. Okay, so let's click insert. And so what I've done is I've replaced the little camera picture with, with my picture. And I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and just do all six of these. I'll try to do this quickly. I wanted to just point out a couple more things before I conclude. Um, let's see, 8229. 
I'm going the wrong way. I sure am. There we go. 8229 JPEG. I'll start here. I really wish that we could do this like batch process. I wish that we could just pull up all six of these at the same time. Um, one of these days, Blackboard might catch up with the rest of the 21st century and not make us do these things one bit at a time. It's, I know it's aggravating. It's aggravating for me too. Believe me, it's tedious on my end um, as well. It's like, why can't we just drag and drop this stuff? That's what I want to know. Why can't we just drag and drop? Okay, let's see. This next one is 8230. Another picture. <clears throat> A230. I'm trying to make sure I get the JPEG and not the raw file because if I get the raw file, it's just going to give me a little question mark like, huh, what did you mean? Because it's not going to be able to read that. You have to have special software to read the raw file. JPEGs are universal. Every, every computer, every device that you have can read a JPEG. Um, raw files, you have to have the software or you can't read them. So I am very aware that this is tedious, you guys, and um, I know you're all saying, when are we going to get to the fun part of this class? And, and, and I promise you, we will start getting, uh, having fun and getting creative, um, but you have to know this stuff, and I, I just, I can't really see any other way um, to learn it than to just break it down and, and do these do these little exercises. You know, ideally you're gonna to get to a point where you can make these, you know, you'll, you'll have had enough experience making these decisions, making these, these changes in settings that you can just make that call, you know, right there while you're out shooting. Um, and it takes a while to get to that point. And, and if you don't stay in practice, um, you'll, you'll forget and you'll have to kind of go back and relearn it. If, uh, at least that's my experience. If I, if I uh, stay away from my camera too long, I sometimes have a pretty big learning curve when I, when I come back. Um, you know, the best thing you can do for yourself is use that camera every single day. The more you use it, the more you want it to be like breathing. You want to have to not think about it. And that's sometimes easier said than done. And so that's why we're doing these exercises. I, I, you know, if you look at the syllabus, you're going to see that we're going to, the first half of the semester, we're going to be doing more activities and quizzes than creative stuff. Okay, but once we've got all this basic stuff covered, then I'm going to be able to assume that you know these things, and then you're going to be able to apply these to these, um, you know, these bigger assignments where you actually have, you know, some aesthetic and some, uh, you know, subject and formal uh, criteria that, that you need to, to fill. And you're going to be making these decisions yourself. Uh, so most of you indicated when, uh, you know, I want to know more about my DSLR. I want to know more about my camera. Well, here's how we do it. It's tedious at first but you'll be really glad you did it. I think most of you were glad for that um, taking apart your camera exercise, and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that that was a real good thing to do because maybe you wouldn't have ever done that if somebody hadn't made you do it. You know, That's my thinking on it. Okay, so anyway, here's the last one. All right. Okay. All right, so he, here, they, here they are, and... Um, you know, basically what's going to happen is the top three are going to have variation in um, exposure, okay? The bottom three are going to have variation in, in white balance. Now, I'm, I'm not sure that I put the right ones in here for mine. I was working kind of quickly. I, you know, expect you to be a little bit, um, you know, take your time and be a little bit more, more, more careful. But then, uh, you know, what I'm asking you to do is you know, tell me what your ISO, f-stop, shutter speed, and degrees Kelvin uh, were when, when, you, when you shot that image. Um, I am going to go back into Lightroom for a second to just kind of remind you where you can find the metadata, okay? Um, the metadata 
if you go into the library area, the metadata is, my, yeah, let me close this little thing out. Okay, it's right here. So if you can't see it, you gotta click this little, this little thing right here. And, and this is, a, you know, eventually I'm gonna have you guys giving me your raw files, probably through Drop, Drop, Dropbox. Um, maybe through the Behance program, I'm still kind of figuring that out, but you know, then I can come in and I can see exactly what, you know, exactly what you're, you're doing. Okay. So here's your, here's your dimensions here. One sixtieth of a second at F 2.8. It says what lens you were using. Um, it says what ISO you were using, whether or not you used your flash, um, for the, um, at least on, on uh, yeah, the uh, Kelvin degrees are not showing up in here, but under develop. And of course, this is where you're going to be going anyway to uh, make those adjustments. Because remember, I'm going to be asking you to, um, you know, try to take all six pictures um, in the part two of this activity and make them look the same. Okay, so if you, um, you might need to go into develop, unless you were taking notes while you took the pictures um, in you know, with it, with your camera, um, you know, this will tell you right here, here's how many degrees Kelvin this one is. It's 6,350. Um, and, and that's why it's a little on the warm side. Cause if you can remember, um, 5,500, I think was about the range, uh, where, where something might be, um, considered kind of neutral. Um, and so, um, I'll, I'll show you this more later. You're not going to actually make any changes right right now, but just you know, when you're doing the second part of this, this is this is where you're going to make those adjustments, okay? Um, but anyway, I don't want to. I'm going to just reset that. That's the thing that's great about shooting in RAW. You can go and mess these up as much as you want and reset it, and it all comes right back to where it was, okay? So so anyway, I'm going to ask you to fill in you know, everything here and, um, click out of here. And once you've done, you know, all six of them, I'm just going to do the one for now. I'll probably for the, the sample blog, I'll, I'll do uh, one of my indoor ones as well. So you can kind of see that, but, um, I, th I think that's enough to kind of get you started anyway. So, um, of course, click on post entry and, um, <clears throat> One thing I noticed with the first uh, couple of, uh, of activities that you guys did, um, I, I, I realized that it does take a little while for the whole page to load. Um, and again, that's because I'm asking you, you know, there's however many people there are in this class. There's like 20 some odd people in here. And I'm asking each of you to, you know, upload a lot of different pictures. Um, so, you know, once a whole bunch of people have started posting their, their, um, responses here it's it's going to take a minute to load but just just let it you know just open this up and then sit back you know go get a cup of coffee or whatever you need to do um, give it a few minutes to load so that ideally you can scroll through this and see everything that everybody's done um, and and so I you know I know I know that this seems um, very very tedious but the, the, the reason being that's what you have to do to get this kind of um, output in the end so that I can see this so that everybody else can see it and we can just pull it up and very quickly say okay here's the six exposures that you did um, for, for your for your cloudy day and here I can see you know very clearly okay this one's a little darker this one's lighter this one's cooler this one's warmer so on and so forth um, so they, they should look you know for the most part they should look very uniform okay um, with the um, exception of that, you know, you're all going to have different compositions and different subjects in there. But um, so I'm, I'm hoping that this uh, made, made sense. Don't forget, you guys, that you do need to comment um, on at least two other students and um, just just something relevant. Please use complete sentences. Um, it, it does count a few points off if you don't, you know, if you don't comment. This is the, the only way that we're really going to have a group dynamic in here is if you guys... Um, you know, communicate with each other. And part of what we're supposed to be doing is having, you know, having a dialogue uh, about what we're doing, helping each other out. I'm glad to see you guys helping each other out on, on uh, GroupMe. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, you know, but we also need to have, 
an exchange happening, you know, right here. Ask somebody a question, give a comment, you know, just just whatever you want to do. Don't just say, hey, that looks cool. You, you know, if there's something that you think looks cool, you need to say why. Um, but but make sure that you do comment to at least two, two people here so that we've got some kind of an exchange, some kind of a dialogue going. Okay, so I think that's uh, this, this uh, tutorial or lecture or demo, whatever it is, has run long enough. So I'm going to um, go ahead and uh, close this one out and I will come back with another lecture and another video and I'll, I'll talk you through part two. Okay, so have fun.